Thank you very much. Welcome to Two for Tonight from Lobel Chez Francois. I'm Jacques Herringer. Tonight I'm going to show you how to prepare a lover's feast. Pick your evening, do a little shopping, and then do a little prep work ahead, and then bring that special someone right here in the kitchen and show them what you can do. Strut that culinary stuff, and who knows what's going to happen. The passion is certainly going to rise into that room. Remember, love begins in the kitchen. Our menu tonight is, first of all, a salmon riette. It's a very velvety dish that's perfect to spread on bread. You can use it on a picnic. It's a great first course that you prepare in ahead of time. While you're preparing the main course, you can maybe sip a little glass of bubbly while you're doing that. Our second course is a traditional poached beef tenderloin. One of my favorites. It's in a very nutritious broth with seasonal vegetables. You know, it's a dish that you don't see in restaurants too often anymore, but it is delicious and really not that difficult to do. Don't be intimidated by any of these recipes. You can do them. And our final dish is a classic baked Alaska. Hot, hot, hot meringue around creamy, delicious ice cream. You know, that's going to raise the temperature in the place for sure. All right, our first dish are riette. What are riettes, anyway? The traditional riette is pork, usually, and then another meat cooked for many, many hours, and there's plenty of fat in there. We've got to have our fat, don't we? What's wrong with fat, anyway? Nothing. Absolutely not. This dish, this dish is a modern version of the traditional riette. You cook them a long time in the old days and you, till the meat shredded and then you packed them in a tureen and you put fat on it. It was a way to conserve the harvest, if you will, and to be used a certain amount of time later. This dish is very fast to make. It's made with seafood, very helpful. Those salmon have omega-3 fatty acids in there, very essential for the diet. If you can find wild salmon, the season is usually a little shorter. You can find the uh, farm raised year round, and there's nothing wrong with a high quality farm raised, but wild salmon is the very best. The theory being, not only do you have the better color, which makes the riette look a little bit better, but it's actually, you know, gone in this little trip out to the ocean and back and had it fed on the diet that it needs, and then when you eat it, it imparts that nutrition and flavor to you. You know, our ancestors, when they saw a wild fish or a wild beast, they would gobble it up thinking that they would get that wildness. Well, I think there's actually a nutritional point to that. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to take our wild salmon and poach it here. Just about five minutes in an aromatic broth. We already have some here that's prepared ahead of time. This needs to be done ahead of time and then cool down. You could bake it if you wanted to or saute it, but I think it's nice to poach it. And then we're going to take smoked salmon. This is a combination of smoked and fresh salmon. Now, I like to use a very richly smoked, a long smoked salmon, which is usually the style that you see from Alaska which I'm going to dice up here, and we're going to make the traditional riette, but with fish. And of course, we're going to add a little fat to it, because you've got to have that fat in the riette for that mouth feel, for that texture. All right, we're going to cut up the salmon. We're just going to dice the uh, smoked salmon here. Put this over here. We've diced up the uh, smoked salmon. We're going to put it in our little handy dandy blender here. All right. And I am going to take butter, of course. <laughs> this replaces in the traditional riettes the fat. What's wrong with butter? Nothing. It's good for you. You, kn you know you want it. You know you do. All right, we're going to take a couple of tablespoons of butter. 
and put it in there. Mm. Mm. We're going to take, all right, I'm trying to be good to you. I'm going to put a little olive oil in there, too. Extra virgin olive oil, which gives it a little flavor. I think that using exclusively butter makes it a little too rich. Using exclusively olive oil doesn't quite make it rich enough, so we put a combination of the two. Plus, with the olive oil in there, you can feel better. Oh, there's olive oil in there. That's good for me. It's all good for you, ladies and gentlemen. Pure whole food. Give that to that special someone, and then he or she will have the energy, as you will, for good loving and good living. All right. We are going to take uh, some lemon juice. Right now, our salmon is just about ready here, so I'm going to pull that out. But we must let it uh, cool before we mix it in, so I'll just put it right next. Look at that beautiful color on the wild salmon as opposed to the uh, farm-raised salmon. It just doesn't have the color. Let me show you how to peel the lemon because you want the outer skin only. The inner skin, which is white, can be very, very bitter. So just make sure you get yourself a potato peeler or a very sharp knife and just see, try to leave that inner skin off there. Chop it very fine and blanch it or boil it, however you want to call it, for about four or five minutes to get rid of the bitterness. And we're going to add that to our riette. You know, I have to call it riette. You know what it is in English? Riette is called potted meat. No wonder the French never get along with the Brits. You know what I mean? <laughs> Imagine if I put potted salmon on the recipe, that's worth about a buck and a half, maybe. <laughs> now, if I put les rillettes de saumon, that's $9.95. <laughs> then I'm going to put a little heavy whipping cream. Oh, about a teaspoon. Or, God, they're mighty stingy with that heavy whipping cream. You know what I mean? <laughs> Don't you keep a gallon at home? <laughs> of course you do. Everyone keeps a gallon of heavy whipping cream handy at the house. All right, and then a little finely chopped dill right here into our mix. There you go. And then if we can figure out how to process this little thing. I mean, in the kitchen, I have one this big. We're going to process this, and this can be relatively fine. All right, we're going to put it on high here. Now, there's one final step in our riette de saumon. We are going to... Take the salmon that we poached ahead and just flake it, if you will, into, you can just do it by hand or with a fork, just do it this way. Because we want, I want kind of a, a little texture to it. It's just uh, more pleasing to the palate, if you will. And it's so good for you. You know, I think if you prepare a healthful meal for someone, that that intangible good feeling, knowing that you've given them the best, the best fish or the best meat and, and cooked in the most healthful manner just kind of is going to carry out through the whole evening. All right, we're going to flake the salmon in there and then I'm going to take the contents to the bowl. Now, I just want to mix it together lightly so as not to completely um, annihilate, if you will, the salmon so it has a little bit of structure to it and crunch. All right. Now, I better taste this to make sure it's acceptable. Hmm. A little more salt and pepper. And try to use sea salt, whole sea salt. All those natural, uh, especially trace minerals, are still in there, and it goes with your seafood perfectly. Then I'm going to put this in a serving dish right here. And you can make this up to two days ahead of time. This is the part you prep ahead. This is the part that you serve while you are preparing the main course or later on the baked Alaska. You have some raw product in here, so you don't want to leave it out very long. but Put it out maybe about a half an hour beforehand and serve it with some nice toasted country bread. Put it on here. And if you happen to have a sprig of fresh dill handy, of course you do. 
You could garnish it. And voila, les rillettes de saumon. Our second romantic two for tonight dish is one of my personal favorites. It is a poached beef tenderloin. This is a real old fashioned traditional dish. Certainly you'll find it in Alsace, which is a traditional province where my father, Papa, comes from. That's where the name of the restaurant, Chez Francois, comes from, from Papa. Otherwise, uh, I'd be unemployed without him. Ask him, he'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Really what makes this dish so terrific is the healthful and nutritious beef consomme that you poach it in. Poaching the beef in there is just an old-fashioned, delicious way of doing it. You know, the gelatin in the consomme and in sauces in general aid the digestion. The gelatin helps you assimilate all the great nutrients. That's why when somebody comes in and says, sauce on the side. You know, it's tough, it's tough for a chef to take. All right, we can argue about butter and cream sauces, but not the traditional broth and meat and fish sauces. All right, first of all, we need to get some vegetables because we're going to garnish the plate with some vegetables. I have leeks, turnip, carrots, celery, for instance. Potatoes would be perfect also. And what we want to do is cook those in the consomme, cook the beef in the consomme, and then put all that back together and all the goodness from the beef and the vegetables and the gelatin are going to make you a dynamo. I'm telling you, you're going to love this. And it's real easy to do. It's an old-fashioned cooking technique. I guess it comes from the time when you didn't have the stove top and the grills and all that sort of thing. I'm going to show you how to make the vegetables look purty. Here we've turned them a bit, tourné en français, which we do in the kitchen. We spend lots of time taking, for instance, carrots or potatoes and making them in sort of in a diamond shape like this, and then we use the peelings in our stocks and sauces. They're not wasted here. At home, it's maybe a little bit more of a stretch to try to find something to do with them, but here, there you go, a sharp little paring knife right here, and you have a carrot, for instance, or a turnip. Now, we need to prepare the beef. We have our simmering consomme. We have our vegetables, which have been cooked ahead. This is the part you do ahead of time, and in front of that special someone, you poach the beef, and then you make a little bit of sauce if you want it with it. So let me show you how to do the beef here. Now you take a piece of beef tenderloin, which is considered the best part of the beef, and the leanest. You take a length of twine, a little kitchen twine, and you tie up the beef. Tie it at all. Why do you have to tie it at all? Very good question. You preferably do not want the beef touching the sides or the bottom of the pot because it would cook faster, it'd be in contact with the metal. And you want it to cook evenly throughout, so you suspend it. Plus, it's a good chance to tie something up. <laughs> That's the best part. All right, let me just tie this up here. Then you can take a spoon or a, you know, a, a fork or something like this and use it to tie this up. There I am, back to tying up again. And we're going to put it into the simmering consomme. And there it is suspended. It is not touching the bottom of the sides. And that's going to take about 10 minutes to cook there for medium rare. Now, in the meantime, we prepared the vegetables. I'm going to give you a little sauce to serve with it. This is optional. It's not absolutely necessary. I'm going to take, oh, about a quarter cup, if you will, of the consomme. And it's already boiling for me. You know, this is what we do in the kitchen in the back. We have, we can't wait around while this boils, et cetera. We have pots and pans stacked up on the back of the stove that are hot. So when we get an order, we automatically have a hot pot or a pan and boom, 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 you get it right out quickly. So I'm going to put the heavy cream in there, a little bit of salt and pepper, and a little fresh chopped tarragon, which we have right here. Oh, about a teaspoon will do. Just enough for two. And just give that a boil. That's just about ready here. I'm going to take a spoon and run a finger right here. And you see how that line holds? Can everyone see that? That sauce is thick enough right there. Just took a couple of minutes, especially if you've preheated your pot. So we're going to take our 
pre-poached vegetables. How are you going to heat this back up? Have a, put them, you could put them right in with the beef, right, and take a slotted spoon and take them back out so they're hot. I'm going to arrange these on a plate. All these vegetables have different cooking times. So what you'd want to do is cook them separately in small pots. The carrots take about 10 minutes. The turnips, the potatoes take about five minutes, for instance. The leeks also take about five minutes. And some of them, just depending on which ones you're using, are different cooking times. And you want to keep them a little crunchy, a little al dente. Like <laughs> <laughs> so cook them separately, and then just put them back into the simmering consomme when you're ready to heat them back up. How do you make the consomme? Well, it's, it's actually very easy. You take your bones, your beef bones, especially marrow bones, put them in a pot, always cold water and vegetables, and bring them to a boil, and you simmer them for about oh, an hour, hour or two. And then that's your beef broth. You season it with a little salt and pepper. You put a clove, a bay leaf, thyme, et cetera, in there. And you have your basic beef sauce. To make a consomme, you take ground meat, ground beef in this particular case, some egg whites, and some vegetables again, and you put it in once the consomme, once the beef broth, excuse me, is cold, is cold, and you bring it up to a boil, and the meat and the egg whites act as a filter. It strengthens the consomme, makes it a consomme double, a, a, a strong flavored consomme, and the egg mass and uh, meat act as a filter. Let's see if this is poached here. All right. All right, we're going to put it over here. Take a knife and cut it away. All right. All right, now I'm going to cut this into four. Oh, yeah. Now, this is a little rare, but I like it this way. And then I'm going to put it on the plate. Open side up like this. And we're going to take a little bit of our sauce and put it around. This is really a great dish. I mean, and you have a little fresh sprig of, there you go, of tarragon. Voila, poached beef tenderloin. Our final two for tonight romantic dish this evening is a baked Alaska, omelette norvégienne in France. It is a great dish, and the, the thing that's really wonderful about it is the contrast between the hot meringue on the outside and that cool, creamy ice cream on the inside, and you flambe it right in front of that special someone. All right, in order to make our baked Alaska, we need to make an Italian meringue. What a surprise. For some reason, if a meringue is not cooked, you just put the sweetener in it and just whip it up. It's a French meringue, but if you cook it, it's an Italian meringue. Don't ask me why, I'm not sure. We're going to take about a half a cup of, in this case, I'm using evaporated cane juice in place of sugar. This is the pressed juice of the cane, and it is merely dried and not processed any further. You can use it one for one with sugar, and in my opinion, it's a lot more nutritious. You can find it in your uh, better grocery stores or in just about any health food store. And we're going to take about a half a cup of water. Got it, that started. And we're going to boil the sugar or evaporated cane juice. We're going to put our candy thermometer in there. And when it reaches about 250 degrees, we're going to start whipping our meringue. This gets a little complicated. We're going to start whipping our meringue, and when it hits 280 degrees, then we're going to pour it into the meringue, the egg whites, and make the Italian meringue. While that is cooking, we're going to have to prepare our base for the baked Alaska. I happen to have here two circles of genoise. It's about a four-inch cake circle right here. Now, for those at home who don't happen to have some genoise or a pastry department, as I do, sitting around in the back, get a couple of big cookies, <laughs> even a chocolate chip cookie. You didn't hear that from me. I'm going to be drummed out of the Chef's Association. But the main thing with the cake is you need it as a base to build the baked Alaska on. 
Why is it called a baked Alaska? You know, the story goes that it was invented in Delmonico's restaurant to commemorate the Alaska Purchase. You make this completely ahead of time. Don't start this in front of that special someone. All you're going to do is take it out of the freezer and pop it in the oven and then flambe it, and that's, that's your grand finale of the evening. What we're going to do here is moisten the cake. Obviously, if you have a cookie, you wouldn't do that. We're going to take a little syrup, simple syrup, uh, half evaporated cane juice or sugar, and water, and then we're going to put a little orange liqueur in this particular. You know, I really probably should taste this. Well, I can do that right here. It's a dirty job, but somebody's got to do it, you know. You've got to see if all the ingredients go together. So let me try this here. Remember, if you put it in a glass, it's drinking. If you put it in a bowl, even if it's a big bowl, it's tasting. I love orange liqueur. Mm. All right, let me take a little of the liqueur. Do you think I should taste it again? It may have changed. No, it's, it's probably all right now. And we're going to put it into the simple syrup and imbibe the cake. Not the chef, but the cake. All right. Let's put that over here. All right, now, we have this. Now let's start our meringue. We're going to take four egg whites. That's all you need for two. A pinch of salt, which helps uh, whip the egg whites a little bit. And start our... If I look awkward around these, it's because we have a big mixer. And as my friend Michael will tell you, I never cook. I have 35 people in the kitchen to cook. I just taste. And don't be intimidated by making a meringue. It is very, very simple. The essentials are to have a very clean bowl. If there's any grease on the inside of the bowl, the meringue won't come up. And put a little pinch of salt or cream of tartar. And it's almost ready here. And this is just about ready also. Be careful when you remove the uh, candy thermometer. All right, just one more second. As soon as this gets to the soft peak stage, we're going to take our 280 degree cooked sugar or cooked evaporated cane juice. The only thing you might notice using the evaporated cane juice is it's slightly darker. Slightly darker. But listen, this is a wonderful, romantic, classic dish because you're going to flambe it. You're going to do a little show. Strut that culinary stuff. You want to pour it in slowly so as not to completely cook uh, the eggs or the meringue, the egg whites, that is, too very, very quickly. Now we're doing this in real time, and this just doesn't take that much time. There we go. This is, a, this is definitely a prepare-ahead dessert. Put it in the freezer. It sits in the freezer until you're ready to go. The day before. Make it the day before, no problem. Your romantic meal, you don't want to spend five hours in the kitchen. Yeah, right. You want to get on with, you know, other things. So, but you do want to stretch your stuff a little bit, do the main course. This is how we do it in the kitchen. We have some prep ahead of time. We have our sauces ready, some of our garnishes ready, and we put it together. All right, now, let me just show you how the meringue comes out here. There it is. Right there. It's a little warm, and I also, we need to let it cool, and I happen to have some in a pastry bag, which you can uh, easily find in most uh, stores. Now, I'm going to take our ice cream, which we happen to have handy, vanilla ice cream in this case, and put it a little soft here, but that's all right. Now, do you make your ice cream? We make all our ice creams and sorbets here, everything. Of course, otherwise it's not a French restaurant. Vive la France! <laughs> all right, then we're going to take our meringue, and in concentric circles around the ice cream. Do two of them here. Whoops. And if you have a little bit of the meringue left and you're feeling like an artiste, <laughs> you can uh, put a little like this. Very simply, you're going to make this and you're going to put it in a serving pan, such as this one. 
and freeze it. Freeze it right in the serving pan. Have it ready. When you're ready to serve, you take this out of the freezer and put it in your oven and you brown it for four, five, six minutes just to get a little color on it. And when you pull it out, you have your baked Alaska. Now, one more thing. You take your orange liqueur. You think I should taste it again? Sure. It's, it's probably okay. Pour a little of your orange liqueur around it. Either light it with a match or put it on the stove. And oh. voila. That is going to heat that room right up. Voila, l'omelette Norvégien, baked Alaska. Thank you very much.